Okay, here we're going to look at another problem, a single population proportion uh, two-tail test. Once more, let's make sure that we can go through this problem and make sure that we can figure out what kind of test it is without that being given to us. Now, this problem has a little bit more going on in it, so let's make sure that we can uh, extract all the information we need so that if we're starting from a white piece of paper and we don't know what it's not telling us what kind of test it is let's make sure we can figure it out for ourselves so while at a dinner party having a lively debate with an old uncle about labor force unionization he claims the labor markets in the u.s are more competitive than in canada he supports this claim by saying that in canada roughly 30 percent of all workers are unionized while in the U.S. it's closer to 11%. You can't believe the unionization rates are so low in the U.S. So we do a little research, and we find an article that points out that of a sample of 225 workers, just 32 of them are unionized. Do these numbers support your uncle's claims about U.S. unionization rates? Boy, okay, so... It's a little bit longer, but everything that we need is right there. So what we're looking at to, to keep into context, into perspective, what is our problem? What is it we're doing? We want to see if we have evidence to support our uncle's claim about the unionization rate in the U.S. So his claim is that while in the US it's closer to 11%. So that's the claim that we want to see if we can support. So this one here we can ignore that information about Canada's unionization, right? It's a little bit of a red herring. It's a bit of a distraction. It might be some number that we might think it's important to the problem but really it has nothing, it's not part of the problem. We're looking specifically at our uncle's claims about the US unionization rate. Now, I know that it's a proportion, so again, when I'm formulating my test, step one, I know that it's a proportion because here it is saying out of 225 workers, 32 of them meet whatever is that criteria that we're measuring. And here that criteria is, are you unionized? Yes or no? Here we have 32 yeses. So 32 out of 25. So that's telling us, uh, 32 out of 225. So that's telling us that this is a proportion. What kind of test are we doing? Well, our uncle has said, that in, in Canada, it's 30%, while in the US, it's closer to 11%. Closer to 11. He's not saying it's greater than 11, it's less than 11, it's at least 11. We're just saying 11%. So this is telling me then that I must be doing a two-tailed test to see whether or not that claim that it's 11% is true. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, our evidence supports his claim. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well, now we can refute his claim and we can say, no, uncle, you're just, you're, you're talking nonsense. So we've got our test. Next item on the list, of course, give us a level of significance. Test statistic, like all tests that we use, that we're doing on proportions, we will be using the Z distribution. Again, there are sample size requirements to using the Z distribution for tests on proportions, but as far as I'm concerned in my workbook, in my classroom, those sample size requirements are always met. So we just will always use the Z distribution. The sample size requirements are not um, too stringent. So using the Z distribution is generally safe. Our standard error, again, we have to make sure here that we use the proper proportion. I use the hypothesized value, not the sample value. And we divide by n, our sample size. 
So here our sample proportion, so let's see here I have my P bar, that's 32 out of 225, so that's 0.142 and that 2 is repeating. So there's my sample P bar, let's keep it to three decimals just for fun, minus a hypothesized value, so here this is 0.11, 1 minus, divided by that sample size. And again, here it's really crucial that you make sure we use the right number. I have definitely seen students incorrectly use that number from the numerator of the proportion. The correct number to use is that denominator, right? So that's going to be 225. So what do I get here? 0.142 minus 0.11 divided by 0.11225 and I have a, a Z of 1.53 as my Z score. Next step, same, same as always. You guys are probably experts on this process now. So I take my Z score, I scroll down to my Z tables, I look up 1.54, here's 1.5 and 4, follow that down. I have 0 0.0618. zero six one eight and of course you know again it's a really easy mistake here to say well that's my p-value right because again of the three different tests lower tail upper tail two tail tests two out of three tests if you're studying for your for your exam and you're doing lots of practice problems it's possible that two out of three or the majority of the practice problems that you do are going to be one tail tests just because two out of three tests are one tail tests. So you might be inclined to say, okay, that's my p-value because you get into this routine, you get into this habit and you make that mistake. You forget what we're doing. Oh yeah, this is a two tail test. I'm testing for equality. My p-value is double that. So here I'm going to have a p-value of 0 0.12. Let's just round it to 12.4 as my p-value. Good critical value approach. We have looked up that critical value a few times. Alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.025 here. And so we found that to be 1.96. Both of our results, the p-value and that critical value, both of them lead us to the same conclusion, which is that we do not reject the null hypotheses. Right? Again, we can draw a picture. I do this more than I say I will, but it can be helpful. Draw a picture. We have our two critical values, 196 there, 196 there. We reject if we're up here, we reject if we're down here, and of course we do not reject if we're in between. Our test statistic was positive 1.53, somewhere in here, as we can clearly see, it's in that do not reject space. What does it mean? Well. Our evidence supports a null hypothesis. I don't have any evidence here to refute my uncle's claim. So the evidence in this case supports what my uncle is saying. I cannot say that the U.S. unionization rates differ from the 11% that he is stating. Good. Okay. Let's add on a bonus one here. A, B, C, D. And let's go through and provide an interval estimate for that true 
um, population proportion. Now this one is, well, one of the reasons I'm doing it is because there's another little difference here that can sometimes be a little bit tricky. The calculation is very familiar. I could write it like this, that it's, you know, the point estimate plus or minus that critical value uh, times the standard error. Standard error of the proportion. And of course, you know, that, that looks similar to what we saw before, x bar plus or minus, critical value, and that would be the standard error about the mean, right? So the, the, the structure of that formula is very similar. And so students would be very much inclined to then write this like this, because, you know, here we just did a test. And I know, I know that this piece here is my standard error, right? It's always that point estimate divided by the standard error. So then if I'm doing an interval, well, certainly I might feel inclined oops, to do exactly the same thing, right? And calculate that standard error like this. But the problem here is that an interval is not a test, right? They're very different, not very different, but they are different pieces of analysis, right? A test, we're testing a claim, a statement, an assumption, right? There's, there's a hypothesized value there when we're doing the test, which is why when we're doing the test, we assume the validity of that null hypothesis, so we assume that it's true, and so that calculation, that hypothesized value follows us through those calculations. When I'm doing an interval estimate, well, there is no hypothesis. There is no hypothesized value. It's just an estimate of some unknown population parameter. So I don't have P0. All I have is P bar. And so that is, again, one of these small little details. So much of what we do is similar. But here's that one little detail, that when you're calculating that standard error for an interval estimate on a proportion, we're using our sample proportion. Otherwise, it's going to be very much the same. So that was 0.142. That critical value, well, that's the same as what we had up here. So that's going to be 1.96. And now this is going to be a little bit different. 1 minus, oops, 0.142 divided by, and that sample size was 225. So I'm just going to calculate our margin of error here first, just to make sure that everything goes as it should. Times 1.96. So that gives me a margin of error of 0.046. So now I have my interval here. My point estimate is in the middle, plus 0.142, that gives me an upper limit, 88, and minus, that gives me a lower limit of 0 0.96. So this again, interpretation is very familiar, right? This is a 95% interval. It's a 95% interval estimate for the unknown population proportion. So I'm 95% confident that the true population proportion, uh, in other words, the proportion of the U.S. labor market that is unionized, is between 9.6 and 18.8%. And here again, we can see the consistency with the test, right? Because here we saw, well, that hypothesized value, it resides within that interval. And so, once more, we can see that our result for that interval estimate, well, it is consistent with our result from the hypothesis test. I'm 95% confident 
that the true proportion of the U.S. labor market that is unionized is between 9.6% and 18.8%. 11% is a possibility. The fact that 11% is a possibility is consistent with our inability to reject it here. Again, that doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is true. It means that at that level of significance, I cannot say that the null is false because that hypothesized value is possible. Okay, good. So that's it. That's our last video for module nine. We've gone through a fair bit of material in module nine. It's preparing us for what's to come because now we're just going to build on to that. We'll get into module 10 now to population testing. And you will see a lot of what you've learned in module 9 is going to carry over. Test formulation, rejection rules, type 1 errors, type 2 errors, all this stuff that we talked about in module 9. We're not going to talk about it specifically in future modules but it's still going to be there. It's going to follow us through. Okay, thank you all very much for watching. I hope that this has been helpful.